Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I am joined by Thomas McPhee to talk about the technology of stage theater. Howdy, howdy. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED30. All right, so theater obviously has come a ways since, like, ancient Greece. I, I, yes. th- I think we've made a few progressions, yeah. <laughs> um, some changes have been made. Some more people have been allowed to participate in the room. Very true, yes. Um, kind of that, That's kind of independent from technological uh, progression. Yes. Uh, but, you know. And, and the thing to keep in mind about a lot of these technologies that we're talking about is... A lot of times I like, you know, you you take a look at like what's on the horizon, what's coming up. And, and, you know, you talk about all these fantastical sounding technologies and people go like, well, yeah, but like that's, you know, that's that's too expensive. Right. It's not going to happen. Um, But the thing to always keep in mind is like what's expensive now and only possible, you know, on like Broadway or, you know, like big budget things will eventually, you know, become cheaper as, as, you know, more technologies are, you know, come around. And, um, and so eventually, you know, we might be seeing a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about in smaller fringe, you know, independently produced works. And, uh, so the reason that I became really interested in this topic is, uh, actually because I, am involved in a production here in the Twin Cities of Annie with a um with a youth uh uh production company Young Artists Initiative. Um they hired me to do the uh the sound design imagine that podcaster, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and um and so I you know really started thinking about like okay, you know, how how does this fit into the whole like, you know, technology progression um and you know is 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 theater now significantly different than like theater when my parents were our age right Mm -hmm. um you know because and and this is an area that i haven't really explored a whole lot um so that's like that's one of the reasons that i was super excited to do uh an episode about this um yeah so i started off by just making like basically a list of the different jobs in a theater production and kind of you know brainstorming how have those things changed as a result of new technologies that have come about. Um, so of course I started with sound design cause that's what I've been doing <laughs> and that's what I know. Yep. Um, and you know, obviously, so we have like audio projection, uh, has improved by a lot, you know, microphones. Um, you know, I, I even remember, you know, the microphones that we had at YAI back when I was in junior high and high school, right. They sucked, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. it was awful. Um, and nowadays it's like, Oh my gosh, you know, we, we've got like, five microphones for the main characters. We've got a couple of area mics for, you know, the entire ensemble, right? And, you know, if you've got somebody halfway competent sitting at the uh, at the sound booth, you know, it's going to sound great. Everybody's going to be able to hear, uh, you know, what they need to be able to hear in, in, in the, the production. Um, and with the new microphones, you know, they're getting smaller and smaller and easier to hide. Mm-hmm. So you're not only affecting sort of the auditory experience of a show, you're able to impact the visual experience, the ability for an audience to suspend disbelief right. and not go, man, they're doing a great job, but that mic is just hanging off their ear and yeah. it's really distracting. Yeah, and and I think one of the big improvements that have been made to the microphones is like the the radios that they use because a lot of times yeah. with you know older microphones you've got the actor turns their body and then their body is in between the receiver and you know the radio and it's like oh they, they cut out shoot yep. um and i've seen i've seen that not only you know in theater but also like i do i run the soundboard for the church that i go to and you know like yeah that's <laughs> that kind of thing has been uh, a huge improvement mm-hmm um, I also found that uh, inserting sound effects, you know, um, I have been able to very easily, you know, source them from online repositories that, you know, people just, you know, hey, I made a recording of an old police siren, right? And, yeah. you know, they put it up uh, under a Creative Commons license. Boom. Perfect. That definitely would not have been nearly as easy, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things that I love about our, our you know, this this new culture this new society that we're building online where it's you know like 
uh, people sharing their work with each other mm-hmm. freely, um, and 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 yeah, just like making it making it so much more feasible for all of this creative, you know, potential to be to be harnessed. Mm-hmm. I also, um, I don't know if this is sort of the program that you use in your work, but you know, when I started college, um, I hadn't done any sound design work mm-hmm. yet. Um, but then I sort of fell into it with one of the first shows I did because I really liked making playlists for like pre-show, intermission, post-show. Yeah. And I basically got a crash course in QLab. Okay. And then taught myself QLab. And being able to have a more autonomous space to work with sound cues and being able to upload everything into the QLab workspace and tweak it all in there and do every edit you need and set up cues to follow each other and make it so easy that the board operator doesn't have to do anything mm-hmm. other than press the space bar. And sometimes it will just go for the whole show though. That relies on perfect timing, which is maybe not the greatest right. idea, but it does simplify a lot of things for other people as well as increase your ability to edit and to sort of develop the sounds, how you desire, which I think it's always nice when you as a creator can have more control over the thing you want and then worry less about when you push it out and let other people touch it. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, and especially, yeah, when you, when you've got a production like stage where it's, you know, so many moving parts, so many different people touching all of these different, you know, and, uh, it's, it's amazing that any of it comes together as well as it does. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, another thing that struck me, is that of course we we no longer need to have a live pit orchestra right yep um and that's i mean that's definitely a game changer because it it reduces the cost of putting on like a big musical yeah. but, like by orders of magnitude <laughs> yeah and i think it's interesting when um when you think of like i grew up doing musicals in high school with like the high school band yeah and it you know it was always fun but you always sort of relied on their ability to rehearse as high schoolers Mm -hmm. and to be good but then you also had as the singer had to meet with them and like meet them halfway Mm -hmm. because it was always just this collaboration of everyone just needs to try a hundred percent. None of us get any sleep. Let's hope it's a great <laughs> show. Yeah. Um, being able to do it more remotely, being able to work with recordings that sound pristine and are able to maintain a level of integrity um, in their sound. Uh, it frees up a lot of time and energy for people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, it, it definitely kind of gets into this, this worry that like, okay, once we become okay with using just recordings to replace like the musicians, right? Like what Mm -hmm. other parts of this live experience are we going to start replacing with, you know, other things and, you know, it's, yeah, it's like, where does it stop? Right. (laughs) I mean, uh, Oh, I've forgotten his name. I'll have to look this up. Uh, Peter Brooks. There we go. He directed uh, the really, the really famous uh, Mahabharata uh, series of plays that were on Broadway. Mm-hmm. Um, he wrote this book all about theatrical design. Um, and one of the things he talks about is that ultimately in the end for all, for like a performance mm-hmm. and you could argue he was speaking about theater specifically, but I know a lot of people would be like, well, isn't that just installation art uh, that all you need is a space Mm-hmm. and light and that is all you need to create a narrative and an emotion and a performance of some variety so mm-hmm. i think while technology can change and it affects who gets hired who appears all that stuff i think in the end i sort of agree with that that you will always need space whether it be digital or physical both at work we need space mm-hmm. and you need light even if in some sense the light is the absence thereof that's still a lighting choice you need someone to make a choice there Mm -hmm. about that and the rest of the pieces can be changed and evolved in however many ways you desire that that almost makes me 
think about the uh i forget what exactly its title is but there's a song that is titled you know like four four twenty two or something like that right yeah and it's just the a john cade song right yeah it's it's the it's it, and it's just literally a somebody walks out to a piano sits down at it and sits there for four minutes and 22 seconds and you know and it it, it was intentionally made to ask the question like what is music right mm-hmm. um and it makes a lot of people mad which is why i love bringing it up <laughs> next job that I had written down is set design, which I have very, very little experience with because uh, I live in a digital world and (laughs) do not uh, usually interface with like, yeah, altering physical spaces. Um, But uh, one thing that I did find uh, while I was researching this was that 3D printing has actually... Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, have a large, large impact on, uh, you know, the ability to either print, like, scale models of the set and stuff to kind of, you know, help visualize all of this. Um, But also, I I would imagine that 3D printing actual props, you know, would be possible depending on what what material they're supposed to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also think you have the option... You know, the the technology of things like AutoCAD and other Mm -hmm. programs that allow for designing through a computer helps a ton. And even just like the simple premise of like if I draw a sketch for a design or if even if I draw like a light plot, the fact that I can upload it online and Mm -hmm. send it to someone halfway around the world means that there's a lot more connection and ability for people to work on things, even if they're not right next door. Right. A lot of it works to remote access so remote access to building an object that you may not have the materials for or access to but because of a 3d printer you you can just make it anywhere yeah um and i think also just the increase in efficiency in tools Mm -hmm. right and it's not as sexy right saying that we have better screwdrivers or better band saws Mm. than we used to have isn't like the obvious like this will blow your mind but i do think it's generally speaking we're able to provide more training mm-hmm. to people um, all across the world, but also just keep improving the numbers on those things. It makes the process faster, more efficient, and I think in a lot of ways safer right. as well. Yeah. And actually what you said about uh, being able to send like digital schematics and you know things like that to – anybody in the world uh reminded me of of how like right away when we started you know our first production meeting for annie right our our stage manager um you know shared a google drive folder with us that had several subfolders right all perfectly yeah. organized for each different area and you know like <laughs> as soon as i do any work on sound like boop it goes right there in that folder um so andrew can see you know like he can access all of the sound effects that i'm making right away he can see exactly how little uh you know how far behind i am on sound effects <laughs> yeah yep. <laughs> no hiding exactly. when it comes to google drive unfortunately <laughs> um but yeah like and and you know, so I think it would, it also facilitates right um, collaboration between like our our lighting designer, uh, who's actually Brian Mitchell, who you might know. Oh he, yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. He uh, he went to Morris with me and uh, and managed to get him uh, involved when when I found out that we hadn't gotten a lighting designer yet. Um, but like you know, he can he can work together with our. Uh, stage designer right uh mm-hmm. the set designer and and you know figure out okay like based on where you're putting all of the stuff on the stage right you know where do i need to light and um mm-hmm. uh and yeah and they, and they, you know they don't need to wait for our weekly production meetings in order for that yeah. to happen um now how often that actually happened i have no idea <laughs> but I think the option is important yeah you know there are going to be people who will take advantage of that option mm-hmm. and want it desperately. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, even if it's not right, many of these things can become more used with time. A lot of new stuff. It's sort of like, oh, we've done it this way and it's always sort of worked. I don't know if I'm ready for that, but I think you give it time. If it adds a level of convenience, more and more people are going to start using it. Right. Yeah. Speaking of lighting, I didn't have very much that uh, came up, you know, when I was when I was researching lighting. Um, the one thing that I have learned during this process is uh, gobos are wonderful and can be used for anything. Yes, gobos. Oh, gobos are so good. <laughs> 
Um, and well, with 3D printing and all this sort of stuff, go, the realm of possibility for gobos and frames and things like that, just out of this world now. You could make anything, mm -hmm. any kind of shape. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think, like, for me, one of the things that I really enjoyed when I was in college was I got a little experience with light design. And partway through, our school finally got some money saved up to buy some LED lighting instruments. Hmm. And I think, you know, the fact that those are becoming so much cheaper and so much more uh, affordable and accessible, the fact that they're going to save you money and they're going to save power, mm -hmm. but just the fact that you don't need to mess with 37 gels and like have 15 lights so you can get all the different possible colors. You oh, need. sure. Sure. And, you know, the fact that you can remotely change the color, the direction, the tilt, the shape of the light um, from a computer screen just gives you so many more options and you don't need to use as much stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we only had, I think we could only spring for, five somewhere between five and ten of these leds which wasn't enough to you know cover everything that we needed to have right. but it gave us so many more options that you could have like our base lights and then have these leds just come in for the special coloring effects mm -hmm. but that you could have them do one color for the first half of the show and then a second color in the second half and it wasn't like someone in the intermission had to unscrew a light and then re-put a light back <laughs> up or anything like that yeah and you and you don't have to mount like three different lights that are all pointing at the same area just so you can have one for like a cool colored scene and one for a warm colored scene and one for neutral. Yeah. 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 Um, speaking of gels, it has been entertaining, uh, seeing on Brian's like Snapchat story, uh, you know, all of the times that he's had to sit down and try to sort through all of like the gels that were left over from the last person <laughs> who put all of this stuff away. <laughs> Everyone claims they're going to put in a good effort to fix the gels and put them away nicely, and it never happens. And you'll go in, and you'll grumble and be really unhappy that the person before you didn't fix it. And then at the end of the show, you'll kind of go, well, it's their job now, and you sort of move on. It's like code refactoring, right? That's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's always someone else's work, but it always sucks when it becomes your turn. Mm-hmm. Now, video projection is related to lighting and can be yeah. used to be to do some really crazy creative things. Um, I recently went and saw a, a production down here in Minneapolis called Alienation, where they had like I, we walked into the into the theater and I see these two like large circular. Uh, you know, kind of projection screen areas to either side of the stage and like one really huge one up and behind that was supposed to look like an old TV set, right? And I was like, immediately I was like, I'm going to love this. <laughs> I, I'm going to love what they do with their projectors. Um, and yeah. I did. It was, yeah, it was really, really creative. They they used, you know, the side ones uh, to kind of give us stuff that the you know imagery that wasn't necessary for the scene you know but like added to it of course mm -hmm. and you know um and so it it you know did a lot to kind of complete each one of those one of, each one of those like scenes that they were doing mm -hmm. um there was a show i i got to see 3 years ago mhm mm think 2 3 years ago by the uh, elevator repair service which is a new york theater company that I really love. Um, and they did a show called Arguendo, which looked at, and was like a, they used, the script was based off of exact verbatim sections of the court transcript. Okay. Um, of this case, uh, state of Indiana. Um, basically they wanted to rule that uh, strippers were um illegal and couldn't be housed in buildings and then other people argued no you can't do that because that's an infringement of first amendment rights and the uh right to perform art mm -hmm. um so it was that discussion and the show had these projections that would happen that were all about hitting the comedic timing of certain lines it okay. was as if the projections were another character in the show and the characters would sort of point and look at it and it bring it into the audience. So it wasn't just there to like give you 
creepy video footage to set a scene or to give you real life documentary footage. Mm -hmm. It was so much more about being able to expand the jokes Mm -hmm. and the humor of the show. Um, So there's so many opportunities to do things that aren't just sort of reference based, um, sort of documentary based or weird sort of art movies in the middle of shows as sort of part of the ethos of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, you can get a lot of humor out of it if you've written your comedy well. And I wonder for that show, it sounds like the script was written with those projections kind of incorporated into it. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. Um, and it's, and it's always interesting when you get, you know, get something like, uh, you know, a, a, a classic example, you know, a Shakespeare, you know, yeah. script, right. That is like, okay, we're going to take this and use the technology that's at our disposal now, you know, to completely, mm-hmm. you know, kind of present it in a way that never would have been possible back in the 1500s or whatever. When did he live? <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds of years ago. We'll just Something go with like that. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it is interesting to try and think about, like, we have technology and access to things that couldn't even be conceived of. Mm-hmm. Right. Like when, you know, back when in Shakespeare's time, like the idea that there would be the sound of thunder, that wasn't absurd to think about because they'd do that thing where they'd uh, – often it would be they'd roll boulders or big stones okay. around above uh, the heads of the audience to sort of make that sound of thunder. Or then you know, you'd adapt to the sheets of metal that you just right. – like, a lot. Um, but now it's not even like, oh, we're going to use these – things that existed 200 years ago and were manipulated in this way to create the sound of thunder. Now it's this person recorded a thunderstorm off of the coast of blank place. And now we're listening to it Mm -hmm. and imagining that that is the thunderstorm that, um, you know, happens in the tempest or whatever. Um, And I think there's, for me as someone who is a writer, as well as sort of a director and someone who thinks a lot about adaptation, that question of how to use technology in a way that does really enhance the story and what's being told without feeling out of place or too extreme is always really tough. I mean, in general, right? It's a question about, yeah, we're going to do Romeo and Juliet, but we're setting it in 1989 Greece sure. and putting this and that lens and frame on it. And then, you know, thinking about sound and projection, when do you incorporate design elements that don't exist within the text itself? And how mm-hmm. do you support the text with things the text couldn't even have imagined? Yeah. And actually, and I'm now thinking about like plays that are written contemporary what are they going to look like in the future, right? When we yeah. have technologies that we can't conceive of currently. Um, that's a fun, fun thought experiment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can imagine that, you know, I I feel like a show like Rent, mm-hmm. which to some degree is of its time, right? As we move towards the future, there are elements of the show that will look different because we've, changed a lot of those circumstances but i think is still so much you know part of the reason it's so popular is it taps into a lot of common desires around sort of like health and security mm-hmm. and sort of rebels and outcasts and iconoclasts trying to make their place in the world thinking about like the way that you can use makeup or projection to age characters in that show and to mm. you know through illness and the way to represent illness on stage through technology is going to be really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And some of the some of the video projection examples that I that I have not seen in real life yet, but uh, you know, like seen references to is when they take into account like three D objects that are on stage yeah. that you can then project stuff onto and you know of course the projection itself if you projected it onto a flat surface would look totally warped and everything you know but once once it's projected onto the object that it was meant for then it becomes like whoa um and you can you know have objects that totally change over time because you know mm-hmm. the projection that is 
being put onto them changes over time. Yeah. Which just sort of adds so many more layers of precision in timing yeah. and location on stage, mm -hmm. right? Like you have to be on it or else you ruin this whole projection. Similarly, sort of, there was a show in New York that Daniel Radcliffe was in, I believe. Okay. Where when you went and saw the show, you could choose to sign this consent form and give them some basic information about who you were. And then everyone who saw the show was on, sort of essentially in this – everyone who agreed was in on the stage um, sitting in these chairs. And Daniel Radcliffe, the actor, was in one of the chairs, and they were sort of all on their phones. And the actor would get up, Daniel would get up, and interact with these screens where what they could find – of information of you just from a basic social me social media search okay was thrown up on these screens <laughs> and became incorporated into the show uh-huh um and so you know it's of course classic lesson of we share way too much information online anyone can find out anything mm -hmm. but i think the fact that you know people were choosing to have themselves explored like that and it would change each show because everyone's information would be slightly different and yeah. how to interact with that being on stage with this person where they are directly interacting with you and your information but it's still a show and you're not an actor in it right yeah and these kinds of yeah like interactive theater experiences can be done without much technological you know input but i think mm -hmm. that um like the current data technologies that we have at our disposal give us a lot more possibilities in that realm you know like you could have uh pieces of information being you know transmitted to different members of the audience you know selectively right yeah. um you know, like, like you could collect people's phone numbers at the beginning and, you know, like, you know, put them into groups and, you know, then, then it becomes an entirely new, you know, job up there in the cue board that, you know, <laughs> yeah. when do we send and out also these thing, things like, uh, VR and interacting mm -hmm. with things in a digital space layered on top of the real space. I, I saw a show many years ago where they, they had these sort of virtual projections where if you opened up like a specific app in your phone and held it up as you were watching the show, you saw bits of information mm -hmm. you couldn't see without looking through the phone's camera. And I think we'll see a lot more of that become prolific as more and more people get higher tech phones available to them for cheaper yep. as well. Yep. Yeah. Cause it, it, currently it would be prohibitively expensive to try to provide uh, a cell phone for every single person <laughs> in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> While I was researching different types of interactive theater experiences, I remembered an interview that I heard on the Story Etc. podcast, which is kind of an alternate reality twin show to The Extra Dimension because they are both monthly shows, they run a little bit longer, and The Extra Dimension tackles ways that technology relates to other parts of our lives. Story Etc. explores ways that storytelling relates to other parts of our lives. They had an entire episode all about interactivity, and Tom Crowley, one of the hosts, interviewed Clancy Flynn of Immer City, who created a, a play, an interactive play, called Blood Will Have Blood, and I'll let them tell you all about it. I'm Clancy Flynn, and I'm the technical director of Immer City and part-time resident writer. Blood Will Have Blood is an interactive play that um, you essentially listen to, but it's also performed by one live actor. And you don't know this at the time, but you are Fleance from Macbeth, so it's a spin-off of Macbeth, I guess you could say. And it's made so that your choices affect the outcome of the story. So there's an audience of about 12 to 16 people depending on the venue and um, everyone listens to headphones to their own individual audio feed while being interacted with by an actor and also interacting with other members of the group. So at the very beginning it's, you're told that you wake up in a forest and you 
meet the witch who will kind of walk you through your experience as Flance. You'll be given a task that you'll do with other audience members and then how you behave during that task will affect the next event in the play. Macbeth explores themes of fate and inevitability and in Blood Will Have Blood I wanted to explore what it's like to live in a world where you think you don't have choice but then to find out that really what you do affects the outcome and I think Macbeth really struggles with this idea of destiny and I wanted an audience to be surprised by the fact that their destiny did respond to their actions in the room and the time. In a lot of ways, when you're writing, you're creating a character arc. And hopefully, I think if you're, I'm, I write very character-driven fiction in theater. So I'm always thinking, how does my character feel about this? And then that informs the next event and the next thing. So for this, instead of having this um, absolute ideal of the character, I tried to think about all the different ways that someone could respond to the same situation and then follow those arcs through to their ultimate conclusion. I'm a big gamer and one of the things I was really into before writing Blood Will Have Blood was a Dragon Age Inquisition, which um, if you haven't played it, is a very character driven game in which you have to build relationships and that can be friendships, that can be uh, fighting partnerships, or that can be romances, with the other characters. So the idea that the world responds to the kind of person that you are was very fresh in my mind after playing that. One of the biggest challenges we faced was this group audience, because to be honest, if I had my druthers, I would love to do everything for an individual audience member. But that's not really possible uh, in a theatrical model, so we had this group, and a lot of times the group would really clump together and they'd want to do their own thing um, and they would be afraid of standing out so it was a little crushing to me when I wrote like 130 different endings or something horrible like that and everyone got the same one I'd be like no why did you all do the same thing <laughs> think for yourselves we learned about creating opportunities and um, making people feel singled out so that they had to think independently and maybe they couldn't see uh, certain choices. So for example, the very ending, um, we ended up changing maybe five or six times to change both the pacing but also how people discovered what other people did. <laughs> and we eventually ended up hiding those choices so that everyone had to really think for themselves when they were given their final choice that really affected their ending. I really hope that no matter how you behave in the story, no matter what outcome you get, you do feel empowered and that it's almost a story about empathy and I think a lot of interaction should be about discovering how empathy um, changes your experience because I want you to feel important in the world and that a lot of times I think you go to immersive theater and it happens to you, it happens around you and I wanted it, you to be part of the story and I wanted you to feel that your actions, no matter what they were, <laughs> affected the story so that you're never powerless and I think that I want you to leave feeling like actually in the world you aren't powerless and when you get out into the real world that feels like something that you don't affect, you would know that actually even the things that I don't see the repercussions of are happening and I'm part of that and everything I do, everything I say has meaning even if I don't know what it is. Remember to check the show notes at thenexus.tv slash TED30 for links to Story Etc. Pod and Immercity. That also reminds me of like 4D experiences where, you know, like um, I'm thinking the, the only time that I've really experienced this is like at Disney World, right? When you go to see the Bugs Life, uh, you know, movie thing where you know they've got the rumble seats and you know the, yeah. the mist that sprays at you and kind of smells like stuff but you can totally do that in a live theater setting as well um mm. and so that that kind of thing um i mean i i i guess i don't have very much to say about like what that's going to do to change you know theater but it's bringing more senses into 
Yeah, I think we're going to increasingly see theaters work to make all the experiences feel more, I guess, organic is sort of the word I'm thinking of, right? Like Mm -hmm. when you want to induce a smell, you're trying to organically insert something into the audience that otherwise couldn't be rendered by just people talking on a stage. Once you start getting to that level, you have to start being careful about and things like either allergens of right. some variety, depending on what these things are made of, but also just depending on the kind of show, you know, the the possibility for accidentally sort of harming or triggering people in uncomfortable ways, right? Mm-hmm. Like if you, like, there is a way in which I think it would be very interesting to be able to somehow, I don't know how you do it, but like composite the smell of blood. Mm-hmm as part of a show right and i think there is value to having that experience but you have to be so on top of letting people know hey it is literally going to smell like blood for like 15 minutes Mm -hmm. if you think you're going to be uncomfortable with that you do not want to come see this show right to tell us a little bit about technology in the theater from the perspective of a playwright and to tell us a little bit about how live theater interacts and relates to other mediums i brought on david k barnes hello my name is david k barnes i'm a writer for stage and audio and other things i'm probably best known for writing the podcast sitcom wooden overcoats and uh, a few other little podcast things on recently. I live in London, and I currently have a play that's on next week called Timothy, and uh, I believe I also have a play on in Mexico at some point during the year, and I look forward to that happening. And you said that you, you've you done some work adapting, you know, works yes, from, yeah. from one medium to another. Like, yeah. how does stage kind of relate to those other mediums? I had a, a the play that I had on in January last, which is um, was a play for people in in one room. Um, so you know, very simple to 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 achieve. Um, it was about a, a, an accountant who throws a birthday party for himself that nobody wants to go to, and mm-hmm. the only people who do are the new person at work who comes with her um, her boyfriend and uh, this accountant's wife who's who's divorcing him. They and they're there, and hilarity ensues for about two hours. Um, and, uh, you know, it did quite well, but it, it, I, I originally, I had done a, a different version of it in student theater quite a long time ago. And, um, I, at one point adapted it for short film and there wasn't much to, it, you know, I was t- uh, changing what was then a sort of a 90 minute play down into what was meant to be quarter of an hour maximum. And for that, I just, when I was doing that, partly it was in this medium, I know that uh, they always say a close-up can take the space of about a whole page of dialogue. So mm. much of the, the dialogue was cut. I also thought, whereas a play over 90 minutes could delve into lots of different themes all at the same time, a 15-minute film needs to be much more focused. You need to know what story you're telling, what theme you're pushing. Um, I cut, you know, it, there's only four characters, but I cut one of them for the film because I mm. thought I'm going to make this about social awkwardness as opposed to about marriage and relationships and breaking down that kind of thing so i cut down a character i cut most of the dialogue i rewrote dialogue and eventually what i had was uh, a short film script which we did make um i think it's on it's online somewhere which uh carried the 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 genesis the same idea you know a person showing up at a party who's a bit socially awkward who didn't know how to speak to friends opens the door realizes oh god i'm the first person here with a very socially awkward host aside from that the the similarities between the stage play and the film were very slight um and when i've attempted to adapt stage plays to audio which one of them i'm trying to do at the moment and changing a a stage play into what could be a a radio sitcom Mm -hmm. and you realize that what you end up, you tend to scroll back to what was that initial idea? What was the burning image for me in this story? And it might not be the themes you came up with later, but you go back and go back and go back and you go, what was the pitch basically for the play? And you take that and then you pitch it for audio and then you mm-hmm. might rewrite it. So again, this particular stage play for radio comedy, I'm cutting two of the, it was a four-hander again. I'm cutting two characters. I'm changing the central relationship. It bears barely any resemblance to the original play. And part of that is technical, but a lot of it is just, for me, it's the duration 
of the story, like a self-contained two hour story is going to be very different from a 15 minute one. It's going to mm-hmm. be very different from a series that you might say, well, this, you know, you want it to last for as long as it could. It could go on for seven, 10 seasons of whatever. Um, so for that, I'd say you, you go back to your original idea, but I think if you sit there trying to include as much of the original dialogue and setting as, as you did originally, and you're trying to force it in, it just won't work. Right. It's much better to just draw a line and go, okay, what made me excited about this play? What's going to make it really exciting for radio uh, or stage or television or film? And you start from scratch and you remember, it's, not, it's, it's easy not to, because if you have the original script there you're constantly looking at it and pulling out like lines of dialogue again oh i wish i could get that line or that situation and you force it in just don't don't look at the original version at all re- re- remember before you write the new version read the old one get a sense of what it was like in your head then put it down mm. and start from scratch the good the bits you really love will come out of it then much naturally but maybe different and you won't be trying to force it into something it's not meant to be and when i see um i think uh a recording, like a visual recording of a performance, has to be done. Except it's very difficult to do. Mm-hmm. I, I've um, had recordings of my plays down where you, you just put in a camera and mm-hmm. just leave it there. Like, and so you think, well, this is just like you know, watching it for one perspective, like an audience member would. And then you watch back the video, and it always suddenly it looks, it feels a bit empty. Even if you were there yeah. on the night, it was the best performance ever. It's not quite the same. I, I wonder think, if that's uh, because, like in film mediums we're so used to having these quick cuts you know from one thing to another seeing different perspectives and yeah oh i think i think you're right i think there is something to the way that we are trained through the 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 medium the the, uh the culture that we watch we expect things to be done a certain way so much that if you're you know if you're watching a film and you don't have big close-ups. You mm-hmm. start thinking, what's happening in the scene? Well, that's interesting. Why are we staying in a long shot? Why is this happening? Oh, we, this is deliberately slow. Um, and if you're watching something on stage and you think, right, I really should be diving in there, but we're still stuck here. Why is that? That mm-hmm. is, And that's why recordings, when, say, when the National does them or when they when you have a company releases an official um, you know, it's, it's, it's DVD or you know, streaming it live, you have several cameras and you're having to cut and you and they try to do close-ups where they can they try yeah. to mimic the editing of a film in some ways um and it, it can work terribly terribly well but it's so hard mm-hmm. it is so hard to do um because you just don't have the same freedom as you do when you're doing a film uh or when you're doing television um so I, I think that's, you know, it's always good to have the recording for posterity you can look back on. But all the recordings of my plays I watch and I go, oh, it's just. And then I have to remind myself, no, it was great. You were there at the time and it worked and it was fine and you enjoyed yourself. So even if the recording makes it look a bit empty and a bit echoey, right. and it's a bit fuzzy. You go, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. And nobody who was there on that night will say it was like that. They'll also remember, oh, yeah, I enjoyed watching. I'd like to go and see that again if it's ever on again. One specific example of not exactly adapting things to another medium, but presenting them in another yeah. medium would be the live shows for Wooden Overcoats, right? Oh, yes, indeed, yeah. Um, which is, I mean, I haven't been to one, obviously, because I am way over here in St. Paul, and that's yeah. uh, a long ways to London. Can you talk about that process a little bit? And Well, Wooden Overcoats, as a, as a podcast sitcoms written always to be recorded in studio and to never have a laughter track or a live Mm. audience and so a lot of the humor in that um for one thing it means the show often goes down the route of character drama as much as the comedy because we don't need to keep an audience constantly entertained in terms of laughter so we can do little dramatic scenes for five minutes ten minutes and more and also you can have a certain when you're watching um comedy shows uh which you know, things like you know um, veep and brooklyn 99 etc where you know they can have a very very quick um a lots of a quick gag rate and those joke, jokes will build upon the other with a certain rhythm because they don't need to stop well the actors don't need to stop for the audience to laugh so right. they have a very specific rhythm which i absolutely adore and i try to do in, in wooden overcoats when you do it live of course that rhythm can get thrown um and so sometimes what i do is go over the scripts um and I change, you know, I cut down a lot of sound effects. I cut down a lot of atmos, but I also change some jokes. That jokes, I either add, I either add new jokes to them, ones which I think will go down rather better in terms of a live audience. Jokes which are there as purely a rhythm thing, I will sometimes cut if I think 
there's a possibility an audience is going, member is going to laugh. You know, they might find right. that funny and they interrupt it, and that's great. But that will throw off the timing of the mm-hmm. joke. And if the point of the joke is to sound quite funny, as opposed to making a funny point, it's just not going to work. So I do cut jokes. I write new ones sometimes. Um, I cut down the number of characters on stage because mm. whilst all our actors are very talented and can do multiple voices, because as part of a visual experience, you kind of get used to certain actors being certain characters. And if they end up doing several voices, especially within a scene, the audience gets a bit confused. Mm. They don't have that attachment. So you cut down a number of characters. You reallocate lines to other characters. Um, and, of course, there's, uh, it's the visual experience. Um, the actors depending on what they want to do, um, they often adopt a certain posture to denote different characters. Ah. And they do facial expressions as well. So some of the jokes you'll get, you know, a, a character might uh, do a uh, do a joke and one of the other actors in character will look at them in a, in a kind of sceptical way and that will get an audience laugh. And if you were just listening to that, you wouldn't know why there was a laugh there right. at all. But the actors, they do go into it. Um, uh, so, you know, um, we often get some jokes from the fact that uh, Felix, uh, Felix Trench, who plays Rudyard Fun in the show, um, uh, is, is slightly shorter than, than Befair, who plays his sister Antigone. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Befair is quite tall. Um, and as long as we get some humour from that, they're meant to be sort of these uh, twin siblings, but they are very different heights. And we sometimes add in extra jokes or visual references or somebody will go, I mean, look at you, you're identical. And then <laughs> the audience will laugh and will carry on. Um, you know, the actors really throw themselves into that. Uh, Beth, when she's playing Antigone, being very uh, morbid in the mortuary, she will sort of shrink herself down a bit and look very, very tense and sort of dart her eyes around. And it gives the audience a very funny um, a visual cue. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, Tom Crowley, when he's playing Eric, will sort of walk on with a certain swagger, which is very much in keeping with the character. Um, and he will also, again, sort of give certain looks to characters and then go on with his lines. And it, it does add an extra... Um, you know, it adds a certain spectacle to, to what we're doing. Sometimes, depending on the venue we're in, uh, our producers, Andy and John, will also put in lighting cues. And um, I think we did one show in a venue where it was um, part of the episode was set in, in a lighthouse. And um, we managed to rig up a sort of a spinning light to look at, like they're outside a lighthouse. And it just gave it, a, and, and it was brought down quite dark. So you're outside apart from the spinning light while they were doing the lines. And it just added an extra little something. So... Depending on where we are, um, we do try to make the live shows their own thing, which is why we also we, we record them and we release the um, the recordings as, as a Kickstarter rewards as well, mm. which we are currently in the process of doing those for, for the last season. It takes a bit of time because they, they like to sort of make sure they're good sound quality and right. the rest of it. Um, but they, they are their own things. They, other jokes will come up. And, of course, the, the simple thing of in a studio if somebody makes a mistake, you don't use it. In the right. live show, nobody tries to make mistakes, but actors do stumble over lines or they come in on the wrong cue, and sometimes it means the others can capitalise on that and they'll throw in an extra rep, you know, a line or, you know, oh, you, it's, my God, why you came for that door five times and all things like that, you know, and, it, and the audience laugh at it. And it's something which, if you take it too far, I think the audience goes, oh, come on, you should just be getting it right your first time. <laughs> but fortunately, when the show's I've, you know, we, we've done together... It's usually a case of a couple of times during a show, if there's a bit of a slip up mm-hmm. and you can make a joke of it and then it carry on in character, the audience really enjoys it. And you get the sense of, oh, that was a secret moment just for us, those people in the room. Right. We got that and nobody else outside is because it's different from the, the recording you know, on the podcast. So that was yeah, just for us. Yeah, I, it, I, I'm a big fan of the uh, Thrilling Adventure Hour, and which yeah. is recorded in front of a live audience. And yeah. uh, a lot of times, yeah, the, the actors might be riffing with each other on stage and I can't see it. And I'm like, okay, yes. what, what is the audience laughing at? What am I missing here? Um, I, I remember um, it was, uh, let me say, a long time ago, but there was a 1950s uh, radio comedy, uh, which I absolutely adored, called uh, Hancock's Half Hour. This is still one, one of my inspirations even though it is you know all, all that time ago but i remember uh, it was a radio comedy and um there was apparently an internal memo at the bbc um at the time that said um to the producers of that show the actors on stage are doing too many facial expressions <laughs> and getting too many laughs for them and the listeners at home have no idea what's going on and there's one episode quite early on where i think um one well, the, the you know the uh, the actors do something particularly funny and then they just break down laughing themselves but they're trying to hold it in and you can just about hear if you know what's happening you can work that out listening but otherwise you've got about two minutes Mm -hmm. of an audience laughing silence 
some you'll say going, you know, going <laughs> and coughing or something, and then you will start laughing, and it goes on for about two minutes, and you have no idea what's happening. And I can imagine, you know, back then they go, oh, that's not on. Mm-hmm. Listener at home doesn't know what's going on. They're not in on the joke. But it's, I think it's very funny to listen to. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you do get a real sense of this isn't just a, uh, you know, th- this is a living, breathing piece of entertainment. The people doing it are finding it fun. There's something in there which is quite subversive and interesting when you just break down and start laughing because mm-hmm. you don't know what you're doing anymore and the audience are in on that. It's, it can be very exciting so long as it, it as long as it doesn't happen too often the show falls apart right. those little moments are just absolutely joyous one of the forms that technology can can be incorporated into plays that has gotten a lot of criticism is the ability with uh, you know audio methods of being able to feed lines to actors you know like via Mm. earpieces or something like that or a teleprompter uh while they are on stage and Mm. yeah a lot of people have you know kind of it feels that they feel that that kind of cheapens the experience right because then you know there's it's it becomes very very obvious like how that is is affecting the the performance right yeah um huh that I hadn't actually thought about that. That's interesting. I mean, I think it becomes like a an acting challenge in and of its own, mm-hmm. right? Like, because you don't want to have it be so pervasive that actors suddenly don't get, don't ever have to memorize anything. Right. I mean... And the examples, the examples that I saw so far were basically like, we've got this actor, great actor getting older though can't remember all the mm. lines right so so they would you know set them up with an earpiece Adjust- kind of thing yeah, yeah yeah i mean i think i think then it becomes a task of the director and the actor to work together to create such a performance that they're so ingrained in it that even when the line doesn't feel like instinct because they just say it because it's memorized and that's what they know the character would say that mm-hmm. it is fed to them but that that doesn't that experience doesn't break character right that they're still able to deliver that line within a certain margin of error of how that performance was going already um and i think i think if it's there to assist actors who are experiencing difficulties for totally natural totally reasonable reasons then that's i think we should be honest that it's happening but i think that's totally fine i mean i think again it if it's being able to help um, increase the number of artists able to perform their craft on stage and then also using technology as a means to increase the number of audience members who are able to see shows is thinking about, you know, ways to help blind or deaf audience members and even things as like people who have physical disabilities ability to, sit comfortably for a whole show or get into the theater or have seats where they can see the show and things like that. Um, I think working towards smoothing the process of integrating them out makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. Um, Because like, I think technology wise, there's a lot of possible ways that you could help offer assistance to actors of all different kinds who may have certain physical or mental difficulties that prevent them from acting in sort of a traditional sort of way. Right. Um, again, though, it, it's, it's about, it's about creating access and roads in rather than creating sort of excuses for people to not work as hard. But I don't like, I don't think that's a concern for anyone who like, wants to get into acting but has this limitation i think right. they'll take it and run with it so you i think you still get like people like myself who are perfectly physically and mentally capable of remembering my lines and being on stage i don't get to cop out because i'm having like a rough time memorizing my lines it's like no i have no excuse i need to memorize my lines right um but i think there are a lot of really welcome opportunities to bring more people in which i think is important yeah for sure and um yeah, and, and and so one of the things that I thought about while you were talking about that was also like if you know, when we when we kind of 
make it more accessible for, for example, people who are blind, right? In order to be mm-hmm. able to like experience a play, um, you know, at that point we've essentially like modified it. We've, we've, uh, adapted it into an audio format. Right. Uh, yeah. and so that, yeah. And, and, you know, for like, um, for the deaf community, right. Currently the best way that we have if for accommodating them is to have an interpreter there. Right. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, I could totally imagine you could use projectors and, you know, text to, you know, yeah. like show what is being said on stage there, you know, mm-hmm. next to what is going on, um, essentially closed captions. Yeah. But, and I think the ability to integrate closed captions so we can get more stories in foreign languages. Right. Mm, so, yeah. And I don't, and I don't want to say, we don't need translation anymore because I think translation is a really interesting art and I would be sad to see that disappear um, as an art form. But I think in theater, you know, if your characters suddenly leave a English speaking country and go to a different one and the characters are able to speak the language that they're there and they're speaking it with those people instead of, sort of having these conversations in English where we're all kind of pretending that they're maybe speaking a different language or the other, the other nationality folks are willing to just sort of speak English to these Americans or whatever, as is often the case, Mm -hmm. the fact that they could just speak the language and you'd see translations and in the script, it's just in that language Mm -hmm. and that's all you need. Um, Or the ability to, you know, with like Google glasses or whatever sort of, eyepiece augmentation we're likely to get right the ability for individual members of the audience to access translated subtitles of the entire show Mm -hmm. so people can watch the show and read it in spanish or uh, somali or whatever language they desire i think will be really helpful in getting again more people into the room yeah yeah and that's um that kind of thing man i can't wait for that to become cheap and easy for yeah. you know for for mediums such as this right Where, like yeah. i i don't even have enough time to you know go and make uh written transcriptions in english of you know yeah. like the entire hour plus content of of, <laughs> of the podcast um and you know as we all know from automatic transcriptions uh on like youtube uh <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> pretty hit or miss yes yeah The, uh, the National Theatre in, in London um, now does, uh, sometimes it will record live performances for screenings in cinemas, mm-hmm. um, attempt to sort of broaden the number of people who can see it. So, you know, if, if you're in a cinema elsewhere in the country, you can watch a play that's going on right that moment over elsewhere that you can't get to or it's difficult to get to or is sold out. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's great, but... Um, you say the, the the joy of a live performance is in being there. Yeah. As I say, when we do the uh, wooden overcoats live shows, um, you know th- those moments of oh, that actor did that line differently, or we got a different actor in for this role, giving a different interpretation. It's really for those people who are in that room at that time. Mm-hmm. I don't think theatre is. Um, people always think theatre is dying out. It's, certainly, it's it becomes increasingly difficult to put theatre on because. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the same in the, in North America as it is in Britain, but um, um, finding a sp- spaces, f- performance spaces are increasingly expensive. Mm-hmm. It, to rent a place out is much harder than it used to be. Um, rents are going up. It's 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 always going to be more difficult. But there is a unique joy to doing live live performance, um, it, and it's why. Um, actors you know actors uh, always love doing theater and you know for me as as a writer the idea you know i write theater scripts the idea of an actor picking up my script and having to do it night after night after night for you know maybe a month or so um i, I just think i go oh, they must be so bored having to do the <laughs> same lines every time but you know it, 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 it's it's and it's a huge uh, it's a huge task it's, it's a real effort of uh, it's a real effort of um uh, of skill and uh, and you know powering through for an actor, you mm-hmm. know, it isn't. You know, um, I've nothing but respect for, for for actors because it's a really difficult and sometimes grueling job. But there is also a driving force of really wanting to do it. And for the actors I speak to, it's always being on a stage in front of a new audience each night, knowing that the play which might have worked so well last night might suddenly not quite work today, or might be even better, or something will happen. You'll find a way of doing a scene which just 
is entirely new and there'll be a, the, the sense is always different. And that's always very exhilarating. Mm-hmm. And uh, a really good cast, a really good production communicates that to the audience, even without knowing it. And so that feeling of, oh, we're watching something that's it's only been precisely like this right here and right now is still very exciting. Um and you can do as much sort of you know put in as much tech and you know t- uh, technology and, and 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 modern technologies and modern ways of staging. You create something truly spectacular, um, but it's always got to it's always got to uh, serve that idea of whatever we're doing here, whatever we've rehearsed, it's going to be entirely different today somehow, and we mm-hmm. embrace that. And that's I think what's exciting about theatre. Um, um, I mean, I love all the mediums; they've all got their ups and downs but i think for for me at least and for many people it's that sense of this is new this is just you know i can reach out and touch those people this is a real Mm -hmm. thing happening right here um let's just enjoy it and see where it leads us as an audience you get to help shape it even you know when you're not Mm. intending to Exactly. If you laugh, you know, if, if say it's a comedy, you'll laugh in a certain place. And if it's going, if it's going uproariously, then the actors get a sense of that as well. The energy changes. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I will go to see, um, you know, I, I've, I've been to see performances of my own plays and uh, what to say, maybe a few nights in a row and um, uh, early on in the run. And you'll see the actors sort of, the performances will be different on the fifth night to the way they were on the first as mm-hmm. actors have changed their ways of going about it. Equally, you'll find that maybe actors who got a huge laugh in a scene on one day, um, the next day do the, sa- the scene in the same way, expecting a laugh, and it doesn't come. And that really throws, that can really throw you. And as the writer mm-hmm. sitting there, you go, oh, God, maybe it wasn't funny. Maybe it was never funny. Maybe this play was always bad. Oh, my God, what's going on? And yeah. the night after that, the laugh will be there again, or the laugh will come in a different place. And as you say, the audience does shape the experience simply by enjoying it in a different way mm-hmm. to the way that others have done. Um, uh, and even with, a, with a, the most serious dramas, um, you can always feel when an audience around you are invested in what you're watching because there's just this sense, this sort of prickly sensation in the back of your neck of, oh, this is exciting. Oh, I wonder what's happened. And you can feel it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a certain tension there which you just can't replicate in any other way, I, I think. Speaking of, of other mediums like this, I'm always kind of tickled by the the phrase like ah like theater it's you know it's a dying medium right it's only 20 years away from being irrelevant and you know but we've been saying this for like the last hundred years years. yeah exactly (laughs) and it's it's really interesting to consider the differences of you know like obviously theater has that advantage of being like um you know things Things are affected by the audience, um, you know, Mm -hmm. but also the fact that like it is hindered by the fact that it it cannot be a as mass media as, you know, like, you know, something that can be transmitted digitally. Um, Yeah. And and so, you know, you don't you you like everybody talks about Hamilton, but I haven't seen Hamilton because it hasn't come to town yet. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, whereas, like, you know, as soon as a podcast episode from, you know, London, England is published, I download it. I listen to and it. You have I, ac- yeah, exactly. I talk I talk with people from all over the world about it. I, I think that it's interesting in that what you lack or what things like Netflix or podcasts and stuff like that gives you in terms of accessibility to a specific piece of media Mm -hmm. internationally and sort of automatically i think what theater can do is give it may not you may not be able to go see hamilton where you are because it's not there right but because theater really you know can be a person in a space with some lighting and a box you can have access to theater Mm -hmm. anywhere Yeah. And so I think focusing on theater as a medium, I don't want to, I don't want to say we need to pull power away from like the big hit shows, because I think there's obviously value in those shows. Like I think Hamilton is a very interesting show and it was really well done. And the script and the connotations for the script are really interesting racially um, and stuff like that. But I do think there is a way to think about theater that is less about, Let's find 
the best performances and the best plays and then try and capture them even though they're always going to be slightly different because it's ephemeral right, right and more about let's experience theater as a common experience even though it is done differently everywhere mm-hmm. but we all share this idea of people performing live in front of others and trying to tell a story or affect change or interact with folks through this sort of performance which could happen anywhere yeah yeah Yeah, what you're saying there makes me really kind of frustrated with the the current system of like how copyright works for uh. for, <laughs> for for plays. Yeah. You know, like for example, um, when we were you know at, at at our first production meeting for Annie, which you know we like performances don't start until mid March. You know, the actors didn't start uh, rehearsals until mid December or something like that, right? And uh, be, but even so, we weren't allowed to basically publicly broadcast the fact that we are working on Annie right now because the Guthrie, I think, was was performing Annie at the time, and so you know they regionally have a uh, you know rights exclusive rights to like tell anybody that they are doing this play. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and I think also just the fact of how much you have to pay a publisher based on how many people come and see your show mm-hmm. um, and all this information can make it hard for people to tell important stories or if they see a story that they really want to tell because they think it's important. It's sort of, well, we either write our own version of this and hope it's different enough that we don't get sued. Yeah. We pirate this and do it and don't tell anyone and hope we don't get sued. Or we're sort of stuck. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think, you know, for me, as someone who also writes theater, it's very important to me to try and give as much access and as much permission for change to directors and performers as possible while still also wanting to maintain a sense of, like, if it's my career, I would like to make money off of it, but I don't want to hoard the content i just want people to be able to go we're doing your play we'd like to give you some money for it and i'll go great that sounds awesome exactly you can do what you like for it (laughs) yeah it's the um you know the the, like it's this it's the same kind of conflict between the model of like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm creating video content, for example right you have to pay for every single video that you're going to you know view versus all right, I am, uh, you know, making this video content. It's going to be uploaded for everybody in the world to see for free. You know, you're going to see some advertisements with it. If you have, you know, the the ability to support me on Patreon, for example, like right, yeah. um, that that kind of thing. And it's, um, it's it's a really challenging model to get to work when the product itself is not something that is being broadcast worldwide. You know. Yeah. Um, but of course, like like you said, there are pieces of the plays, namely like the script, that can be broadcast worldwide, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and you know, and and then it becomes kind of a not a relationship between the audience and the playwright directly, but the you know the the theater companies that want to put on a play and the playwright. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I it's if if we can see some 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 progress, some change in that, in like the assumptions that we have around how that system works. Um, I think it could be, you know, it it could democratize, uh, you know, the theater system a lot. And I also think that, you know, having an option for playwrights or theater artists in general to look at that sort of Patreon model of, or whatever sort of direct support from a from the consumer base mm-hmm. is really interesting again because it again right like, it removes the it doesn't have to because like I could support a playwright halfway across the world if I wanted to but in terms of like live performance of directors or actors there's a certain degree of I'm probably not going to give money to an actor that I don't know or won't see or don't have experience with in some form of another right but within a community it can really help influence and grow the connections. And then the artists can help not only serve themselves, which I think is still important, but serve the community as well, which I think 
I I would like to see more of artists making sure that the work that they choose to create is informed by the community and the place and location and circumstances of the location it's being done. Yeah, yeah. So I have seen uh, and been involved with um, fundraising campaigns for individual shows and also entire seasons of shows. Um, and it can be much, much trickier. The ones that I've seen have been particularly successful were raising funds not for one show but for a, for a, say, for a program for several shows because mm-hmm. that, for one, expanded the sense, um, the, the number of people who might be um, – the number of people are actively involved and therefore the number of people who could be invited on a personal level to say, look, I'm involved with this. Could you help out mm. and share it? Um, so if you've got, you know, if you're doing a play and the, the total team is 10 people, that's one thing. If you're doing a season, you've got 50 people involved. That's quite another. So the more people who can be involved, the more likely. But it is always going to necessarily be much more difficult because if it's, say, a, a play in, 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 again, in, in London, most of the ones I've seen I've been part of because um, that's where I live. Uh, you're saying, you know, you put out a, a Kickstarter or a, or, a, or one of the others, you, you put it out there um, and it, the whole world can see it, but the only people who can actually see the finished result are the people who are going to be in London on that on that particular time. Right. So you might have people elsewhere who, who support you enough to, 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 to do that and, and to, to put money into it, but you are always going to find it quite difficult, I think, to do theatre. Um, Compared to, uh, say, when with Novacoats, when we raised uh, money to the budget on, online with season two, it took us a month. With season three, we raised most of the budget in just under a week. Um, it, between that, those times, our listenership had expanded. The number of people who really enjoyed the show and wanted to uh, to help us achieve more of the show um, had expanded. We were incredibly grateful, and we, we hope that the uh, listeners enjoy season three as it's coming out now but we are delivering something there that anyone around the world can just download in in a few seconds mm-hmm. or get involved with so i think um in that sense though a theater company trying to raise money it does have that option uh and it can be done well and i have seen it done well um the challenge is to make people who might not be able to come and see it still feel included, Mm -hmm. um, still get a sense of excitement, whether that means the rewards of things like, you know, getting plate copies of the play text or recording of something, or, you know, if you donate this amount, then you'll be able to be a voiceover within the play. So even though you might not be able to see it, you can still be involved in it that way. You've got to find ways to involve people, even if they might not physically be there and not physically be able to see it necessarily. In that, I think it'll always be much trickier than raising money for a, a film or a game mm-hmm. or an audio show. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure how much theatre has been. I, it, certainly, it, it's an option, but I'm not sure if it's been drastically changed by the new technologies and that sense. Right. Um, you could certainly advertise your show to far more people, but raising money is always for fit is always going to be difficult and it's just oh you know how do you excite how do i if i want to put on a play of a small comedy in london how am i going to excite somebody in australia to 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 fund me on that right. if they can't see it so that's always going to be a problem yeah i have a few super futuristic uh okay. type things written down here um, I guess this first one isn't exactly like necessarily in the future because uh, we have seen like rudimentary examples of it, but holograms of, you mm-hmm. know, like of, of actors, of performers, yeah. right? Um, and we've seen these used mostly so far in like musical acts, um, you know, of, of like Tupac or Michael Jackson or, you know, um, Performers who are no longer with us and, you know, there they are on stage, you know, uh, for the audience to see. And uh, one, I don't understand how that technology works. Two. (laughs) You're asking the wrong person. (laughs) Two, um, like, how how does that kind of integrate into our our conception, our, our ideas of how theater should work, right? Because, like... One of the things that we say that we've been saying that that theater has over other mediums is that interaction between the 
audience and the performer, right? That it's never mm-hmm. going to be quite the same. And for a hologram, a hologram can totally be exactly the same every single time that it's projected. Um, yeah. In, in fact, it would, you know, require more work to get it to actually change each different. time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I think, right, like, the the whole idea of seeing, like, the gorillas, that band in person, seeing a gorillas concert, mm-hmm. right, where you're supposed to sort of accept that the music's coming from the animated hologram characters, but you know that really it's coming from the the guy sort of in the back playing the drums and uh, the keyboard, uh-huh. right? But I actually think theaters had this interaction a little bit in, like, Avenue Q, where when you watch the show, you you are meant to interpret everything as occurring as being done and said and acted upon by the puppets, but mm-hmm. you can still see the actors in their blacks operating the puppets. Right. And so it's that, it's that willingness to suspend your disbelief enough that even though the sound and the movement is generally being created by someone who's still part of that ephemeral experience that it's being shifted onto something else. Right. I don't know quite how to do that with a hologram per se, but I mean, you could think about like things like motion capture technology, right? So, mm-hmm. so you have someone in a motion capture suit that generates the movements of the hologram. So it can be more ephemeral, but you have to be willing to focus the attention onto the hell hologram and sort of forget that the person's over there with the motion capture suit on right right and i i wonder if holograms are going to be incorporated most effectively into roles such as uh you know similar to like not needing a live pit orchestra anymore right that kind of thing where we can we can take elements that would be prohibitively expensive or too difficult you know um to put on using a bunch of live people and you know shift those those parts onto holograms while still Mm -hmm. keeping you know whatever part of the performance we actually uh you know are, are really want to have you know be be the live performance aspect yeah yeah i think then we start you know inviting more and more questions about timing and consistency Mm -hmm. um, right like in a musical i think it's a little more understandable to have sort of a digital recording used because you have to keep in time with the music so as long as everyone sort of agrees on when it's starting Mm -hmm. and when it ends for the most part everyone can go along with the same timing because you have all the dance moves and everything's to time but if you start having non-musical performances where whole characters are being played by holograms then every other actor has to adjust their performance to the timing of the hologram right which i don't think is a bad thing it's just a different thing yeah it's it's, it's an it's, level of choreography yeah it's a, it's a new a new challenge yeah yeah mm-hmm. and another one more thing that i came across recently was um the possibility of of live streaming not just like flat images of, you know, a video feed of what's going on on stage, but actually having what they refer to as volumetric video, uh, which I interpret to be holograms, <laughs> 3D, oh, know, okay, yeah. 3D models of what's going on on stage, right? Um, huh. To a remote audience. And it kind of, it kind of reminds me of what they did this year with like the winter Olympics, right? Where you could watch it in VR um mm, now yeah. of, of course that was you are in a fixed position looking at what is you know basically like four or five different flat videos stitched together into a large panorama that you can you know move left and right to look at yeah. um but um what they're talking about here with the volumetric video is basically they have like cameras on all sides of what's going on on the stage so that it can create these 3D models of the people who are, you know, the people and objects that are on the stage. Uh, and, and so then you can, you know, be anywhere you want to be while watching this feed. 
because it, it sees everything from enough different angles that it's able to piece everything together. I think in something like theater, the only like thing that would make me nervous about that in any way is just like the ability to correctly render the amount of detail necessary to connect, right. to catch nuances in performance, right? Mm-hmm. Because it isn't just my body moved five feet in one direction, right? It's so much about facial tics and posture and stuff like that. Right. Uh, but it, but I think that raises this sort of question about, like, do you want to see a show because you want to hear the story and see the performances? Or do you want to because you want that experience with other people? Yeah. Right? Because even with, like, the NTI Live stuff, everyone meets in a common space. We all like go to a movie theater and mm-hmm. watch it. Um, and so the ability to watch theater from your home without having to go somewhere, again, you get that lack of audience influence on the show, but then you also get the lack of audience upon audience right. influence or the conversations that happen immediately after in person, though – not to discredit the opportunity for conversations to happen in digital spaces um, and to have value there. That, ugh. I don't know if I immediately like that, but I also don't <laughs> want to be like that guy that's like, back in my day, everyone saw the theater together. Um, I, I, so then, yeah, I'm 25 and I'm already an old man, you know, as, as, <laughs> as I find out whenever I talk to my high school students. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard. I mean, I think it's, it's a new area of thinking about things and a new kind of experience and i hope that there will be room for that for the folks who really desire it and room enough still for you know 30 people live together in a space seeing a show Mm -hmm. as well yeah yeah um because you know it, it definitely has a lot of possibilities of like um you know currently when we are watching a a performance there are limitations on like how close to it we can be on you know uh whereas if if you have a you know a a detailed enough 3d rendering of what's going on on the stage right you could be right there standing next to a couple of actors who are talking on stage right Mm -hmm. and then um yeah but you know at, at what point does it it become I'm watching a 3D movie instead of I'm watching a 3D live performance, performance. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, also, something I just thought of sort of related to this is, you know, what could be done with sort of holograms or 3D representations or recordings of audiences, mm. right? What if you wanted to fill a theater that had just enough people buy tickets that you wanted them to have the experience that it didn't make sense to reschedule all of them, but was still empty <laughs> enough that it would be kind of awkward, right? Uh-huh. Do you have these sort of AI programs right. that could essentially be people in seats through holograms or just sound, right? How could you also you know, use an AI program like that to inform rehearsals, right? I mean, part of the point of having preview shows, obviously, is so that you get a sense for what it feels like when you bring an audience in. But what mm-hmm. if you had an AI that can help you with that before you even bought a preview audience? And right. So you knew many of the laugh points before you knew the laugh points. That's a, yeah, wow. That's a re- that, that makes me think of Westworld as well. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we fill up the audience with a bunch of uh, hosts who, yeah. <laughs> uh, that won't end well. No, no, no. Uh, um, and one one thing that uh, I think theater has already kind of solved uh, in this scenario is how do you get people to look where you want them to look? You know. Yeah. Um. In you know when when we think about a video format, you control the framing very very closely whereas you know if if we're in a video game or like on stage or something like that you have to have a lot of cues for the audience to be able to know what they're supposed to be interacting with where they're supposed to be looking stuff like that yeah um and that's one of the things that i have been very fascinated by in terms of video game level design (laughs) yeah you know, in theater, it really becomes sort of something the directors and the actors have to think. I mean, not just in terms of like lines of sight, which mm-hmm. obviously is like, you know, a big thing, um, but also just sort of 
if there are subtle things happening in other parts of the stage from where the dialogue is, mm -hmm. how do you make people notice? Yeah. Without and breaking the illusion that the other characters on the stage wouldn't also notice. Right. Yeah. And also like the other side of this, how do you get people to not see what you don't want them to see on yeah. stage? Right. Um, one of the, the very first production that I was in was a jungle book and, uh, and I was Mowgli and we needed to get me on stage so that I could be there when they reveal like, okay, Mowgli went from being this little baby to being, you know, full grown. And, yeah. um, basically we just put, uh, a, a, uh, brown blanket over my head and had me come on with all of the other trees and plants and you know things and uh and then i just jumped out from behind everybody when it was time yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it worked every single time nobody yeah. ever you know noticed when i came on stage so mm -hmm. yeah i think that is interesting I, I i can't think of specific examples but the ability of technology to help directors and actors hide things from an audience i think opens up way more avenues in terms of playwriting and composition of scenes and all kinds of stuff to help you know because you sort of i don't know i always feel weird about this because it's as someone who is often an audience member for stuff i want to feel like i'm being respected by the creators and the people putting it on i hate it when like a form of media feels like it's like riffing on me too hard as an mm. audience member i'm always like mm, come on i'm smarter than this we all know it <laughs> um but i think th there's room still for surprises and secrets and i think trying to manage shows that will that can become incredibly more secretive than they are now while still not becoming so secretive that an audience realizes that it's being lied to lied to because what is theater but lies technically <laughs> i guess uh, but right within the conceit it's being lied to in a way that maybe makes them uncomfortable mm -hmm. in you know i'm now thinking about how can technology be used to you know lie to entire populations uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh yeah <laughs> So don't yeah. want to think about that kind of stuff too hard. Yeah, it's, well, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that's about all that I have for uh, for technology being incorporated into into theatrical productions. Do you have any other pressing stuff that you wanted to go I mean, over? The only other thing I could think of is like within acting again, like I mentioned, right? Like bringing people who have limitations or reasons why they may not have traditionally been brought on stage. Mm -hmm. Right. But in the same vein, you could also add interesting stuff across uh, with prosthetics and props and costumes and makeup to enhance that experience. But I was just thinking like the ability to have like to use artificial, you know, limbs or, like exoskeleton exoskeletons <laughs> or things like that to change your perspective of a character or change their actual strength on stage so mm -hmm. even if it is in a matter of someone may not feel strong enough to walk on stage or stand on stage reliably but even if you have someone who is uh more physically abled um but you know, if they have to demonstrate a show of strength, not just having them break like a brick that's actually a piece of styrofoam that you painted on, but use sort of prosthetics and technology and things like that to actually have them break a real brick mm -hmm. as part of that demonstration um, and the ways that you would hide that within clothing. I, I don't know if it's really useful or will do anything, but I think there's I was just thinking about that. And I was just thinking like, that's how you make the stage version of alien. Mm -hmm. Cause you actually have an exoskeleton for Ripley to climb into. I'm so into, glad that you said you that it. because that's the first place my mind went was like, <laughs> we could have the mech battle from the end of aliens. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I think there's got to be a platform somehow where writers and directors, producers and stage people and tech and lighting can also swap rather more about, what are the upcoming, basically, as how technology is affecting theatre right here and now? Um, what are the effects that can be done that couldn't have been done 10 years ago, mm -hmm. five years ago, two years ago? 
just to get people thinking more because the only way that you're going to develop these ideas is if writers well, partly is if the technology is there partly if writers are asking them to be done and there needs to be a kind of middle ground there where mm-hmm. this huge meeting of minds because maybe i don't get out enough but sometimes i always think i wonder if that could be done or uh i just think yeah aside from having um really cool explosions and like things falling over what else can we do on the on, mm-hmm. on the stage uh, i don't personally know um, I'd love to find out, and I'd love to. F- maybe it's out there. I'm, I'm sure you will turn around in a, in a second and go, "Well, David, actually, there are all these publications." Right. I, I wonder if there's a Why subreddit, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but this is what I, I want. Yeah, this is it. We we always have always interested. I always want to know more. Um, I can never sort of. I can never know enough about this. I always want to be. I think I'd love, ideally, as somebody who writes scripts, to each day someone turns around and tells me five impossible things that I didn't know before breakfast, and I go, "Oh God, I had no idea we could do that." Mm-hmm. And it, I'd love that to happen every day. That would be brilliant. <laughs> All right. So thanks for joining us for this uh, discussion, everybody. I have been your host, Ian R. Buck. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck, and you can find links to other stuff that I make at uh, ianrbuck.com. Thomas, where can people find you online? You can find my online resume of theater strangeness at thomasmcphee.com, uh, M-C-P-H-E-E. And you can also find me on Twitter at sub evil boy s-u-b underscore e-v-i-l underscore b-o-w w why yes that's how spelling works <laughs> i have a website uh, www.davidkbarnes.com uh, where you can find out stuff about me what i'm specifically up to if you prefer less about me and more about uh, funerals on the Channel Island and the sitcom hijinks, you can go to woodenovercoats.com. Uh, on Twitter, is Overcoats Wooden. On Twitter, I am Velvet Barnes because my name is David K. Barnes and I wear a lot of velvet, which uh, was a sartorial choice I made in 2006 and has not gone away. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I am also on, on, on Facebook as well as indeed are we all. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for joining me, David. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. This has been lovely. And uh, this has been a production of The Extra Dimension from The Nexus TV. Uh, If you have any feedback for us on this episode or if you have ideas for future topics that we can tackle since the... uh, the subject of this particular show changes uh, you know, episode by episode, go ahead and get in touch with us either on Twitter at the Nexus TV or email us at TV at gmail.com. All of the episodes of The Extra Dimension are released under a Creative Commons attribution license, so if you want to use any part of this show, feel free to do that as long as you link back to the original page, which, by the way, is thenexus.tv slash so30 where you'll also find all the show notes, links to stuff that we talked about. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Have a good one.